Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and get started and, and let people trickle in. We had a short session to begin with. We've lost a few minutes through the mandatory photo shoot, uh, but we have a, a wonderful panel here for our breakout session on religion and social stability. Uh, my name is Justin Collings. I'm one of the junior faculty here at the law school. I teach comparative constitutional law and, and legal history. And it's a pleasure to, for me to moderate this uh, distinguished panel. I'm going to introduce our speakers very briefly and uh, have them speak for about 12 minutes each, and then we will devote the, the balance of the time for, for questions and answers. I'm going to proceed from uh, my right to left, from your uh, left to right. This is Professor Tura Lindholm. Is that, did I say that right? Perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He is an emeritus professor at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights and a member of the Faculty of Law at the University of Oslo. He's written a, a number of books and articles, uh, either as the author or the editor. A couple of uh, highlights are Islam and Political Cultural Europe, as well as the a Leading Law and Religion Casebook, which he co-edited with our very own Cole Durham and Brett Scharfs. To his left is Michael Quinlan, who's the Dean of the Sydney School of Law at the University of Notre Dame in Australia. He's been Dean for two and a half years and still has some hair left, which is uh, lucky for a Dean. <laughs> um, his, uh, his research is mostly in the area of insolvency law. He's published a, a casebook in, in that area. He had a distinguished uh, career as a practitioner with the commercial law firm Allen's, where he worked for 23 years. I also noted on his web website that for, uh, for several years during the 1980s, he performed throughout Australia with uh, or as one of the Mexican Spitfires, and I'm hoping he'll tell us more about that a little later on. <laughs> to his left is uh, Professor Silvio Ferrari, who's a professor of canon law at the Università degli Studi in Milan. Uh, he's taught uh, all over the world, uh, including in Parma, uh, Torino, Strasbourg, Lugano, Berkeley, Washington, D.C., London, and Paris, among other places. So he is also the author and editor of many books and articles, including Religion in Public Spaces, A European Perspective, uh, Law and Religion in the 21st Century, and many others. So we will begin with uh, Professor Lindholm. And we will hear from all of our presenters, our, all of our panelists, to make sure that uh, they each have time, and then we'll do questions and answers for the group. Thank you. Here we go. The title of the paper I prepared, prepared back home was Social Stability and Equal Protection of Conscience. I then saw the program here, and I saw that it would at the most have 13 minutes. That paper would take half an hour. I'm a, 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 I cannot be cured as an optimist. So I rewrote the thing. Um, the paper I'm going to read to you and present to you has four titles. I want to focus on that. Subtitles. First. Freedom of religion or belief, the language of human rights, international human rights, has an extremely wide scope, and I want to stress that. That's the first point. Second point, I want to address um, something you may have heard of, the golden rule. My third title is the American legal tradition of religious freedom protection, where I see wonderful things and some problems. And the last one, very short, equal protection of conscience, two challenges. And those two challenges are the main thing I'd like to discuss. Here we go. So, having been given this very important topic, I initially thought my question would be like this. Can by a right, a country's legal protection of conscientious claims 
or people who are religious? Can they exceed its legal protection or conscientious claims of people who are not religious? And does such differential treatment or protection have an impact on social stability? Question mark. In other words, how disruptive, if at all, of social order is discrimination between protectional claims grounded in serious religious conviction on the one hand, and on the other hand, protectional claims grounded in serious non-religious conviction? Same question. Well, having thought about this for some weeks and seen the title and the schedule we have now, I decided to drop entirely saying anything about social stability in the abstract. Instead, I shall discuss the normative issue of the law favoring protection of religious people's conscience over protection of non-religious people's conscience. That's what I want to focus on. And what strikes me, I admit I am a Norwegian, what strikes me is that the law favoring protection of conscience grounded in religious conviction over and above protection of conscience grounded in non-religious conviction simply is unfair. Such discrimination is, I shall argue, even whatever you think, is prohibited by international recognized human rights law. And it is in breach, moreover, of straightforward religious morality, the morality of the golden rule. Do unto others as they, you know. So let me first spell out <clears throat> the human rights principle I have in mind and then indicate my understanding of the golden rule, the two first headings I mentioned. The wide scope of religion or belief. Now, the term in English, religion or belief, used in international law of human rights after 1945, includes religion as traditionally demarcated. But religion or belief also includes non-religious fundamental convictions. Moreover, people who identify neither in terms of their religion nor in terms of their non-religious conviction, non-religious conviction, they are similarly covered by international human rights law. The religious, the so-called non-religious, and the indifferent. The point of such inclusive reference is that no human being is to be excluded from the human rights protection prescribed by what for short is called the right to religious freedom. The point I'm making is spelled out in the authoritative 1993 General Comment Number 22 of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which was addressing the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, Article 18 of the Declaration. And the text of this general comment at this point runs as follows, I quote, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects theistic, non-theistic, and atheistic beliefs, as well as the right not to, pro to profess any religion or belief." End of quote. That's the authoritative elucidation. And similarly, the European Court of Human Rights, in its 1993 landmark decision, Kokinakis versus Greek, states, and I quote again, European Court, as enshrined in Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Freedom of thought, conscience, and religion is one of the foundations of a democratic society within the meaning of the Convention. It is, in its religious dimension, one of the most vital elements that go to make up the identity of believers and their conception of life. But it is also a precious asset for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and the unconcerned. In a quote. So the same inclusive notion of the human right to freedom of religion or belief was spelled out in this room 
exactly two years ago, today, by no other than Professor François Tilken, who is formerly a judge and vice president of the European Court of Human Rights. And you can have the reference. It was printed in Brigham Young University Law Review. I shall now add a brief note on the language used in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and later on, uh, in the provision, Article 18, which is the provision protecting freedom of religion or belief. And my comment is this. The English term, ta -ta -ta -ta, or belief, should not be understood to include solely religious belief. The point is that the point is to include for protection also freedom of basic non-religious convictions. Life stances, as we say in Norway when we try to speak English, or German, Weltanschauungen, such as skepticism or atheist doctrines or indifference to matter of religion or life stance. This is clearly indicated by the term Ubisdenium, my help, my Russian is here, which is used in the Russian original proposal for the language of Article 18 back in 1947-8. The better French translation is conviction and not croyance or foi. Conviction, conviction, not belief. The terminology may be confusing, and in what remains of this short presentation, I shall sometimes use the, the term religion so as to refer to convictions and adherence of the of the, of, of the religious in a traditional sense, as well as to convictions and adherence of traditionally non-religious people. Let me now turn to the relevant and well-known rule of religious, religious morality that I have in mind, the golden rule. As you know, the golden rule is found with small variations in the scriptures of almost all religious traditions. In the gospel, Matthew chapter seven, verse 12, and similarly in Luke six, uh, Verse 31, Jesus is reaffirming what Rabbi Hillel the Elder, referring to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, had taught one or two generations earlier. And I quote from the um, Gospel of Matthew, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. End of quote. Question, does the golden rule apply to how religious people who are citizens of a contemporary democracy should deal with their others, with the non-religious citizens, concerning the legal protection of their respective freedom of religion or belief in the meaning that I spelled out? Does the golden rule apply to how the secular law of religiously diverse polities today should regulate matters of freedom of religion or belief between different religious and non-religious groups and individuals. Myself, as confessed a Norwegian, a Norwegian Lutheran, I can have very little doubt. Since I come from a country that only recently have ended centuries of hegemonic and privileged state church status for the evangelical Lutheran religion, and its adherence to the disadvantages of all others in the realm, be they of other religions or non-religious or whatever. So in my view, the golden rule most certainly applies to legal regulation of the relationship between religious majorities and religious minorities. Next little item, the American legal tradition on religious freedom protection. The most important and rich national legal tradition uh, on planet Earth, in my view, in the field of protection of religious liberty is that of the United States. When the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was elaborated in 1947-48, American NGO and religious, religious activists, among them the later famous John Foster Dulles and Frederick Nolde, I'm proud to say he was a Lutheran from Pittsburgh, no, from Pennsylvania. Uh, they effectively, these Americans effectively lobbied for strong and clear-cut protection of religious liberty in the language of the Declaration. They were very successful, perhaps too much so. 
For there's a problem here. Madison's famous memorial and remonstrance, the first amendment to the US Constitution, and later Supreme Court uses of the ministerial exception, seem to me to have triggered a the theist reading of religion and exclude a reading of religious liberty such that agnostics or atheists or skeptics or scientific, scientific rationalists, etc., they are not excluded for protection on par with the theists. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I right? I would like to hear from you. As I have argued at some length earlier, legal protection of freedom of religion or belief must accommodate today the legitimate diversity of differing religions and worldviews in contemporary America, and cannot no longer exclude legitimately protection of the con conscientious commitment of human beings who are not religious. And now I come to the last point, equal protection of conscience. Two challenges. There are many more, but the two I want to focus on are these. Number one, can we, put as a question, can we who are religious in the traditional meaning of the word, can we still justify privileged legal protection of our beliefs, our faith-based practices, our institutions, over and above similar protection for humanists, for atheists, for skeptics, for non-religious rationalists? I tend to think the answer is no. No longer can we do that, in my view. Of course, we must be mindful of the distinction between the matters of so-called forum internum and matters of forum externum. Now, US jurisprudence and the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence have found reasonable but somewhat similar ways of restricting legitimate interventions in the practices and institutions grounded on faith, in faith or in conviction. I shall not address this very complex issue now. But here's my last challenge. My first was, can we stick to this privilege as religious people for our affairs, for our institutions, for our practices? I gave you an, my answer. And the last challenge I want to address in concluding these short remarks, I hope they are short enough, is an extremely laudable legislative compromise found in this state of Utah in the middle of March this year, SB 296 and 297. It was a compromise, legislative compromise, between parties whom we are used to identify as belligerent antagonists in the American culture war. Traditional faith groups versus gay right groups. The piece of democratic state legislation in Utah in March this year does not at all satisfy the maximalist demands of the LDS church here, nor the maximalist demands of the LGBT groups. That's not the point. The point is that they did not satisfy the maximalist demands. The point is that, and what is so remarkable, is that this compromise, I will not go into details to say a little, it was acceptable to both parties nevertheless because and insofar as, I would add, it, the compromise regulates access, in the case, to housing and to employment in a manner that both parties have worked out through dialogue, through negotiations, through mutual respectful conversations, premised on the need for practicing civility across deep divides that are not to be eliminated, at least not soon. My congratulations to the state of Utah Utah is, in my view, a model not necessary in the specific legislative outcome of political compromise, but in the exercise across deep divides of mutually respectful civility. My congratulations. Okay, Dean Quinlan.
Law School in Sydney of the oldest private Catholic uh, university in Australia. Oh, sorry, let me start again. Uh, first, could I thank BYU Law and the International Centre for Law and Religion Studies for putting on this wonderful conference on the critical topic of religion, law and social stability. As a practising Catholic and as the Dean of the Law School in Sydney of the oldest Catholic and the oldest private university in Australia, this topic is a critical one for me and for my institution. I want to start this discussion uh, with a quote from St Paul's first letter to Timothy, which really frames what I'm going to say. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving should be offered for everyone, for kings and others in authority, so that we may be able to live peaceful and quiet lives with all devotion and propriety. That's 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 from the New Jerusalem Bible. This afternoon I'll consider religion, religious tolerance and the law and their importance in maintaining social stability in Australia. In order to address this question, I will very briefly consider the influence of religion in the foundation and development of Australia before considering the place of religion in contemporary Australian society. With this background, I will then consider some examples of where religion and law find themselves in conflict in Australia at the moment before expressing some views on the implications of those conflicts for Australia's social stability. Hopefully some of these thoughts will also resonate with many of you from other jurisdictions. In many ways, contemporary Australia appears to me to be a model of religious tolerance. The European colonisation of Australia began in 1788 as a result of a decision by the English Parliament to institute a new penal colony. When New South Wales was first colonised, Governor Philip took a particularly sectarian oath of office as governor by swearing allegiance to the king and to the Protestant succession whilst expressly repudiating Romish beliefs in the transubstantiation of the Eucharist. Subsequent early governors of New South Wales took an, took an oath of office which also included these words. Although a significant number of the convicts transported to the new colony were both Irish and Catholic, despite very many polite requests, it was 28 years before the colonial office in Britain allowed official Catholic chaplains into the colony. And it was only after 1820 that Catholic convicts were no longer often forced to attend Anglican services. Given that background, it's remarkable in many respects that when the colonies federated only 80 years later, the new Australian Commonwealth's constitution specifically eschewed an establishment religion. The overt sectarian, sorry, the overt sectarianism which was prevalent most obviously in employment practices up until the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s in Australia has really disappeared and it's difficult to imagine that that very basic religious freedom to worship within one's personal faith tradition would be impinged in Australia. Whilst the religious landscape of Australia is a constantly evolving one, Australia certainly has deep historical Christian roots and a very substantial majority of Australians have always and continue to identify themselves with religious traditions when asked. From the first census in 1911, the majority of Australians have identified as Christians. Whilst this affiliation has been declining from 96% in 1911 to 61% in 2011, the Christian faith traditions continue to be dominant in Australia, although the numbers of adherents of other faiths and of no religion has been increasing. Between 2001 and 2011, the number of people reporting a faith tradition other than Christianity increased markedly from about 0.9 million to 1.5 million. The numbers of no religion respondents also increased substantially from 15% of the population in 2001 to 22% in 2011. The fact that Australia continues to welcome about 190,000 migrants each year under the official migration program, that immigration levels can change, and that there are of course no religious tests for immigrants to Australia, means that the attitudes of a not insubstantial proportion of the population cannot be predicted and change each year. Whilst Australia is often described as a post-Christian nation, it's quite clear that a very substantial proportion of the Australian population continue to consider themselves to be Christians and that Australia continues to grow in religious diversity. 
To a visitor to Australia in 2015, many outward signs would suggest a strong respect for religious freedom. There is federal and state government funding for religious schools. There are two national religiously affiliated universities, my university, the University of Notre Dame Australia, and the Australian Catholic University. Churches and other places of worship are prominent in cities, suburbs, and towns, and are generally well maintained, and there are many hospitals, charities, retirement homes, clubs, and other institutions, and I'll come back to this, operated by religious organisations, which are a feature of everyday life in Australia. In Australia, religious people do not face threats to their life and property as they do in Iraq or Syria and many other parts of the world. But outward appearances can prove quite deceptive, and the views of those of religious faith, and particularly those of my faith tradition, Catholicism, are subject to regular attack, often because of their faith. The former High Court judge and leading Australian intellectual, the Honourable Dyson Hayden, who is not from the Catholic faith tradition, a couple of years ago made the following observation. Until about the 1960s, Australian society was marked by sectarianism. It took several forms. In due course, all of that changed. But now there may be a new anti-Catholic movement, particularly among the intellectuals, if that is the correct word for journalists. <laughs> Anti-Catholicism in Australia now might be called the racism of the intellectuals. End quote. Uh, and nothing's improved since then. Whilst in Australia, as I said, Christians are certainly free to worship at home and in their churches without fear of attack or fear for their physical safety, there is a misconception by many in the media and in education and in government that this is all that religious freedom entails. This approach disregards entirely the moral duty of Christians not only to live morally, but to evangelize and to act. And this action can be seen in the huge contribution that Christians have made to Australia. Christians also have a moral duty not to allow God to disappear from the marketplace of ideas. Many in Australian society, particularly in the media, express concern whenever Christians speak on moral matters. This is because Australian society, like most of the modern West, approaches morality largely by reference to individual freedom, rights, scientism, subjectivism, pragmatism and relativism. References to absolute moral truths are an anathema to a subjectivist approach to morality. But for many Australians, and I'm sure this is true of much of the Western world, state laws have become a de facto morality. And this is a profoundly important fact that lawmakers need to recognise if they consider that law is or should be morally neutral, assuming that was a possibility. Whilst at law, at least where laws do not require active participation in moral acts, it might be said that laws leave citizens free to act morally and to act in accordance with their consciences, even if they allow acts which are immoral to occur. As, noted, as I've noted, a feature of modern Australian society is the fact that the law by default is considered by many as the source of morality. Changes in legislation, judici judicial or prosecutorial practice can pre present strong temptations for people to engage even in acts that were considered generally immoral by previous generations. It's only necessary to mention divorce, contraception, drug use, abortion, and in vitro fertilization to recognize this trend. These may involve, some of these involve general acceptance of conduct, not only that was generally recognized as immoral by previous generations, but is recognized as immoral under the natural law. The willingness to speak up when something is wrong and to tell it like it is, uh, have long been referred to as traditional Australian values. It's difficult to argue that those values remain prevalent in Australian society. Any fair observer of Australian society would recognise that there's a form of creeping conformity, whether it is in business, the media, or in a social setting, in which it is really considered quite unacceptable to promote or justify a position on any issue by reference to religious values. At the same time, there are well-organised and focused special interest groups who are very skilled in the use of the media and in lobbying politicians to promote the recognition of new rights and the restriction of the free exercise of existing rights through legislation and developments in the common law. With that background, I just consider a couple of examples of how um, religious freedom is being impacted in Australia. Um, and those relate to the laws in relation to abortion, the decision of the Victorian Court of Appeal in Christian youth camps, and the recent referral of the Catholic Archbishop of Hobart to the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commission, which Father Lucas mentioned yesterday. 
Since 2008 in Victoria, medical practitioners with a conscientious objection to abortion have been obliged to refer patients seeking that procedure to another medical practitioner who they know does, does not share that objection. In this way, the law seeks to compel doctors with a conscientious objection to abortion to be complicit in that procedure, although information about abortion providers is readily available on the internet and in the phone book. Some years ago, disciplinary proceedings were brought against Dr. Mark Hobart, a well-known pro-life doctor in Victoria, for refusing to refer a couple seeking to terminate their pregnancy on sex selection grounds to a doctor who he knew did not share his objection. The state I live, New South Wales, has enacted similar requirements through a policy directive rather than through legislation, although legislation is also proposed. In the state of, Ta in the state of Tasmania, exclusion zones make it a criminal offence to protest or engage in a range of other prescribed activities within a 150 metre radius of an abortion clinic. Victoria, New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory are considering similar legislation. During the Tasmanian elections last year, a lone protester, Graham Preston, was arrested for peacefully protesting outside an abortion clinic in Hobart. He held up a sign which had an extract from one of the United Nations declarations. Whilst those charges were subsequently dropped, Mr Preston and a number of other people are currently awaiting trial in Tasmania for other alleged breaches of the exclusion zone. In 2014, the Victorian Supreme Court Court of Appeal decision involving Christian youth camps found that a company owned and operated by the Christian Brethren had engaged in unlawful discrimination by very politely declining a booking by a group promoting views on sexual morality to young people, which were contrary to those of that faith tradition. As Father Lucas said yesterday, in Tasmania on the 29th of September this year, the Archbishop of Hobart, Archbishop Julian Porteous, was reported to Tasmania's Anti-Discrimination Commission for circulating a booklet called Don't Mess With Marriage to the parents of students at Catholic schools in Tasmania. The Commission has six weeks to consider whether or not that complaint identifies a potential breach of the very broadly worded Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act. So what are the implications of this approach to religious tolerance? An unexpressed assumption favouring this approach may be an assumption that religious belief is simply a matter of upbringing or choice. The assumption that religious belief is somehow of lesser value and more easily altered than some other characteristics ought to be subjected to more critical review. In her 1917 work, Spontaneous Activity in Education, Maria Montessori relays a number of accounts of children brought up with no exposure at all to any form of religion, experiencing God and identifying God as the creator of all. For many Christians, baptism is a sacrament. In the Catholic faith tradition, baptism most commonly occurs in early infancy, it certainly did for me. And the theology of the Catholic Church tells us that not only does baptism cleanse the person of original sin, but it makes that person a new creature, an adopted son of God, a partaker of the divine nature, a member of Christ and co-heir with him and a temple of the Holy Spirit, a member of the body of Christ and a member of the church. As the Catholic Catechism explains for adherents of that faith tradition, the person baptized is configured to Christ. Baptism seals the Christian with the indelible spiritual mark of his belonging to Christ. No sin erases this mark, even if sin prevents baptism from bearing the fruits of salvation. The consequence for the baptised person are permanent. The person is changed forever by baptism, and for a baptised Catholic, these characteristics are not flexible, optimal extras that can be, or which society should seek to force a believer to compromise. Since religious belief is such an integral part of a person, a religious person can only flourish when they are freely able to worship and to actually live their faith. As Leikockenberg argue, Committed religious believers argue that some aspects of human identity are so fundamental that, should, that they should be left to each individual, free of all non-essential regulation, even when manifested in conduct. For religious believers, the conduct at issue is to live and act consistently with the demands of the, of the being that they believe made us and holds the whole world together. No religious believer can change his understanding of divine command by any act of will. Religious beliefs can change over time, but these things do not change because governments say they must or because the individual decides they should. The religious believer cannot change God's mind." End quote. 
Finally, it's important to recognise that religion is not simply a personal characteristic, but it has been a foundational element to Australia. It's obvious that nations like the United States, Canada and Australia have benefited greatly from the failure of other nations to afford the same type of religious freedom to their citizens in the past, such that to their great loss, religious minorities have emigrated to those nations of the new world to their great benefit. Micklethwaite and Mouldridge have analysed the reasons for the persistence of religious belief in the United States. And in this context, they particularly emphasise the basic works of everyday charity that churches and believers carry out throughout the United States as a standard part of life. In an Australian context, the Catholic Archbishop of Sydney, Archbishop Anthony Fisher, has observed that the Catholic Church in Australia now has over 10,000 hospital beds, 20,000 aged care places, 700,000 school desks, and assists countless people through parishes, Catholic care in St Vincent de Paul. Five and a half million Catholics in 1,300 parishes in every walk of life contribute in myriad ways to our nation. Democracies, economies, and societies don't just happen. They depend upon a complex of ideals, priorities, and institutions. And in this country, these are largely a Judeo-Christian inheritance, however underappreciated that often is." End quote. Whilst Archbishop Fisher there singled out some particular contributions of the Catholic Church, followers of many other faith traditions have made and continue to make their own many and unique contributions to the well-being of the nation and its people. The Salvation Army and the Seventh-day Adventists warrant, partic Seventh Adventist warrant particular attention as small denominations which have made and continue to make an extraordinary contribution. Calls for religious freedom are not on the evidence special pleading. The state cannot, on the one hand, enjoy all of the benefits religion provides to the infrastructure and everyday life of the country, and on the other hand, seek to prevent the expression of religious belief. Thanks. I think what we'll do, since we started about 10 minutes late, is go into the the break a little bit if people need to, to leave that's okay but we'll let uh, Professor Ferrari speak for his tw 12 minutes. Can we get the PowerPoint up? And uh, then we'll, we'll try to take a couple of questions. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my central point is that the following. We, and uh, when I say we, I mean uh, Europeans, are uh, accustomed to seek uh, social stability through, through the exclusion of religion. And now we need to learn to do that uh, through inclusion of religion. This is uh, my central point. And I would like to start with uh, a quotation by a, a beautiful uh, uh, song by John Lennon. Uh, imagine that there is no countries. Uh, um, well, I'm not uh, able to read it because, oh, okay. Imagine there is no country, countries. Uh, it uh, isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And uh, no religion to. Imagine all the people living in uh, life in peace. Now, religion, together with uh, the state in this picture, is a matter of conflict, is uh, something that, uh, um, that uh, creates uh, tension and uh, conflict. So, given uh, this uh, starting point, uh, what to do? The uh, traditional European answers have been uh, uh, basically two. First, Banishing all religions from the public domain except one, and that was what we know as a confessional state, the state with a single religion 
and the other ones were tolerated or not. Second answer, banishing all religions from the public domain, and basically this is the strategy of the secular state. Now, for a number of reasons, these answers are no more working well, are no more very effective, and we are in a pursuit of a new answer. We are searching for a new answer, and this implies a reconsideration of the meaning of public domain. Um, deconstructing uh, the notion of a public um, domain means uh, to take into account three different processes that took place and are took in, taking place in Europe. First, the secularization of the public sphere. Second, the laicization of the public institutions. Laicization is the French uh, laicization. Um, there is not a corresponding word in English, and that is by itself meaningful. And uh, third, the pluralization of the public space. Let me describe briefly these three processes. Uh, First, the secularization of the public uh, sphere. The starting point uh, um, is uh, uh, the wars of religion of uh, 16th and 17th century in Europe. Wars between Catholics and uh, Protestants after the Lutheran uh, Reformation. Um, now, these were a new type of wars. They could not be, um, a settlement could not be reached through the medieval categories of the just war and the appeal to the superior authority of the Pope. So something new um, had to be found, something new had to be invented to put an end to these wars, and the answer Keynes by a lawyer philosopher, Hugo Grotius, um, who said something, um, who reasoned a little bit along these lines. We are fighting about God. So if we leave God out from the public sphere, wars will cease. We are fighting about religion, so the problem is to build a public sphere where religion is not needed. And that is the meaning of Grotius say, uh, saying, Etsy Deus non daretur. We should build a public sphere. By public sphere, I mean we should build the sphere where we take public decisions, decisions regarding legal issues, political issues, economic issues, this sphere should be built ex deus non daretur, um, as if God did not uh, exist. This is the way out from the wars of religion. And it was by sure and uh, a bright idea. It uh, did not, um, it was not uh, received immediately. It took a long time um, to accept this uh, idea. Um, uh, the idea was developed uh, by the Enlightenment uh, philosophers. And uh, the second step, uh, sorry, I went to how can I go back? Fine. And uh, it's right. And uh, uh, the second step, uh, let's say, the step when, when uh, Grotius' idea were uh, translated from philosophy 
to politics. The second uh, step is the um, laicization of the institutional domain and the construction of the secular state. Uh, we are now in um, the uh, 19th century, um, and uh, um, the basic idea was uh, we need to separate church and state, because if we separate state and religion, then we can grant all citizens equal rights. Equality should be granted by um, excluding any religious influence on the public institutions. What did it mean? It meant, for example, the introduction of civil marriage. It meant the exclusion of the teaching of religion from schools. Uh, it meant uh, um, a number of uh, uh, legal reforms that aimed to build a state, to build the public institution on a non-religious base. So that whatever uh, um, religion you have, uh, or maybe you have no religion, that is absolutely um, uh, irrelevant when we come to the enjoyment of political and civil rights that are given to all citizens, irrespective of their religion or their non-religion. That was uh, the basic idea of the lab liberal state, and there is a connection between um, what the, the ideas of Grotius and this um, building of uh, a liberal state. Uh, then, and this is uh, the third step, uh, something uh, changed. Uh, changed for uh, a number of reasons, you see them in, uh, in uh, the slides. Um, the main consequence of this change is uh, the pluralization of the public uh, space. Um, uh, it has been explained, in my opinion, uh, very well um, this morning by our uh, Turkish uh, colleague. Uh, that is, Different religious beliefs and practices and non-religious beliefs and practices coexist in the same physical uh, space. Uh, what our colleague said this morning was the other is no more there, is here. And this is a very effective uh, way to put the uh, problem. And this coexistence um, is uh, at uh, uh, the roots of a number of tensions that uh, um, uh, surface every day in Europe concerning uh, the building of uh, mosques, uh, the wearing of uh, religious uh, symbols, uh, ritual uh, slaughtering, uh, circumcision, etc., etc., etc. Now, and uh, this is my um, last um, um, slide. What to do uh, in uh, this new uh, landscape? Um, I shall um, indicate three um, points, three steps. First, an open public, public uh, sphere, which means uh, in some way to go beyond the horizon of uh, secularism, um, uh, when we enter the public sphere. There is a, not the time now to go into details. Um, we can uh, uh, discuss this point later if we have time. Second, a fair institutional domain 
A fair institutional domain means that religions and beliefs are treated in an even-handed way, not necessarily in the same way, because each uh, religion and each belief has its particularities, is uh, um, specific, but with fairness, in a fair way. And uh, third, to build an inclusive public space, which means not only accepting the plurality of religions and uh, world views, but also accepting them on an equal footing. Again, there might be room here for differences, but the goal, the aim, is granting uh, plurality on uh, equal footing. That's all. I hope we recovered some time. We uh, will need to clear out in just a couple of minutes, but why don't we do uh, one question and then let the conversation uh, spill from there into the, into the break. Barry Bussey from Canada. Um, I'm just asking uh, uh, Professor Torre, um, your uh, discussion, and very good, excellent discussion, by the way, and certainly one uh, that I'm asking myself in my own personal studies. But I'm just wondering your equality, uh, trying to create an equality between uh, the protections, and I agree with you, religion has been treated and is treated special. But what does equality mean? I'm wondering, uh, does it require the special protection of religion to be removed, or does it mean we allow the other uh, non-religious convictions to receive the same treatment? Very good question, and since time is short, the answer is yes, the latter. Uh, inclusion of everyone at that privileged level where religions have been held. There is lots of complexity theory which Silvio just uh, uh, touched upon. My background is very much a hegemonic Lutheran state church experience, which is terrible. In back, in hindsight, we have got done away with it. We managed to introduce by 1964, or maybe 10, 20 years later, you realized full equality in terms of ter state. Re uh, state um, support financially of all religions and non-religions. The Norwegian uh, group of uh, humanist atheists get per head member exactly the same as the Lutheran church and as the Catholic church guest in my country. And in schools, there is teaching of, of, of religion, but it's the teaching about all kinds of religions and also criticism of religion. So Norwegians are, through school, ideally at least given competence in discussing critically. You may put it this way, they are confused at a good higher level of understanding, but they are knowledgeable about these matters, etc. But I shouldn't go on, because the short answer is the one I gave initially, and thank you for the question. Well, these were, three, these were three very rich and evocative presentations. Each one could have been a keynote, in my view, and I wish we had uh, more time to discuss together. I hope that you'll discuss with the, the panelists during, during our short break and, and as the, the sessions go on. So please join me in thanking all of them.